core portion is called Tet Tzave. It comes from the, uh, I believe it's the um, second word in the portion, and it begins in Exodus 27, verse 20, and goes all the way to 30, chapter 30, verse 10. Today is a special Shabbat. It's called Shabbat Zachor. Can you say that? Shabbat Zachor. Zachor means to remember. Because it's the time that we remember when God raised up an enemy against us, the Amalekites. So there's a special Haftor reading from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 15. In which we understand that um, Samuel and Saul have a confrontation. In which Samuel tells him, if you look down in about verse 20, how it is better to obey than to sacrifice. And it's better to do what you hear than to just offer meaningless uh, offerings. God wants the same thing from us. And one of the easiest take-home lessons we can learn from that is we all at times are off target. That's kind of what sin is all about. And so we have to be willing, unlike Saul, to be teachable. If someone brings something to our attention, if someone wants to bring a correction to us, we have to be willing to hear it. We have to be willing to absorb it and listen to it without getting defensive or without thinking that we're automatically in the right and we don't have any need for this kind of approach. Saul was yet the very king of Israel and he was rebuked by the current judge at the time, the final judge of Israel, Samuel. Unfortunately, after this portion of scripture, everything that occurs with Saul is shown in decline from every part of his kingdom to eventually becoming the kingdom of, under which David would rule. In the Torah portion itself, we find that this is the seventh portion in the book of Exodus where we are at, in which God begins to command how things in the sanctuary are to be. Similar to last week's Torah portion of Truma, in which God ordered how things were to be as well. There's some simple instructions, but I also feel that whenever I bring the Torah portion, I want to incorporate elements of the New Testament so that each of us understands what something that we can take away about our Lord and Messiah or a picture that we can take away. There are many foreshadowing pictures in this portion. And in the very beginning, it tells us about the olive oil that's to be brought. The olive oil is to be brought and usually it was beaten with a millstone in order for the drops to begin to come out. In each of our lives, maybe we feel at times we have those kind of things happening to us, things that will stretch us and hurt us in order that things may come better out of us. The very oil that came out of the crushed olives was in turn to make a great light. And in fact, it was a light that was referred to as the Ner Tamid. Above our ark is the Ner Tamid. The Ner Tamid was very important because at the time of the original tabernacle, there were no windows. So the only light, the only way in order for someone to see was because of the menorah and the near tamid that was to come from that. As too, as we go through things, and as Messiah, when we look in Luke chapter 22 and verse 44, in his greatest trial, he started to actually sweat drops of blood that came, it said, like drops of blood. And the same very drops made him a great light by which all would be exalted. We too, if we believe in Messiah and follow after him, are to become a great light. A great light that will shine in the midst of a very dark place. And we too are to be that light just as Messiah. The whole point of the place called Gethsemane was a place where olives were crushed. And the very place where Yeshua's first trial toward his passion to, was to come forth. In the next verse, in verse 21, we see another picture that's found in the New Testament. We see Aaron was to go each day and each morning and order the lights so that they would shine. The same picture John sees in Revelation chapter 1, where he says in verse 13, I saw as of a son of man standing before seven candles. The same idea that here you have the Lord himself ministering before seven lights 
and Aaron himself also ministering before seven lights. In chapter 28 and 29, we have the pictures of what priests were to be. Priests were to be lifted up for the service of God to do many things as they were set apart and to be different from everyone else. The priests were anointed. They were given special clothing. And as part of that anointing, if we look in chapter 28, verse 20, it said that part of the blood of one of the burnt offerings was to be put on the tip of the right ear, the tip of the right thumb, and of course, the tip of the big toe. And by doing so, the priest would hear, he would do, and he would go as the Lord wanted him to. That anointing was to continue and go forth in all that the priest was to do. These garments were something that were put on a priest because he was to be separate. He was to be different. He was to look different because he represented God. He was to act different. He was to carry special stones on his chest representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He was to bear actual stones on his shoulders to remember to lift up the, the people of Israel in intercession. And intercession is a big part of what a priest does. Special garments were worn for that kind of intercession because the priest was always needed in Israel. The same picture we see in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 6 where we're told of spiritual clothing called spiritual armor in which believers are to wear when fighting a different spiritual battle. But the priest was always something that was relevant in wartime. The priest was someone they would consult saying, should we go up to war? The priests would stand in the gap for Israel when Israel was at war. And so even though the priest is not necessarily thought of as someone in connection with the war, they still had an important purpose and an important role in Israel because they were always constantly to bring back reconciliation. And in chapter 29, we see those words. He is to make an atonement. The very word kafar has the idea of bringing back into relationship. Bringing back into relationship is what reconciliation is all about. Also in chapter 29, we have something very odd. In verse 37, we're told that everything that touches the, the actual altar itself becomes holy. Now that's kind of an odd thing. And when we look back in Matthew 23, verse 18 and following, we see that that was kind of taken way out of context, where people began to understand that their gifts were more important than the altar itself. Thus, Yeshua made a commentary. What is more important, the gifts or the altar that sanctifies it? What is more important, the temple or those who serve in it? And those questions are the same things we should be asking ourselves, not looking beyond, but always coming back to what is the intent of which God has made things for us. The holiness is finally ended in the portion as we look in chapter 30, in which we're seeing a beautiful gold altar of incense created. The idea of incense has always been connected with prayer. This comes out of Psalm 141, verse 2 where it says, I will set my prayers before you like incense, that they may be a burnt offering before your, before your ears, Lord. And that is what our prayers are to constantly be. I want to thank everyone who took time and actually signed up to this week for the prayer vigil for Rabbi Haim. That was very important. And I'm glad that many of us are beginning to catch the vision of how much we need to pray. Over and over again, there's going to come things that are going to be more severe, and we may not have a visual setting, but we have to be people that are instant in and out of prayer as God leads. And that's why we focus on this. The part that I've chose to chant is a visionary part, and we see part of the vision in the actual Haftor for this portion, Tetzave, in which God shows Ezekiel what the future temple is to be like. But God shows us something visionary here in these verses of how we're constantly to understand that we're when, when we are in his sanctuary, his very presence is what sanctifies us. It what makes us holy. It what makes us different. That's why there's a distinction in who the people of God are to be. 
So Lord, I pray that as we read and as we study this portion, that you would continue to bless people and that they would begin to understand the insights that are there in this whole portion. How we're to be a light in a place of darkness or where there is no light. How we're to be, to see the Messiah always ordering himself before seven lights, the seven churches. How we're also to constantly be in prayer unto the Lord. And to understand the important role that priests have in the midst of war or in war type settings. Help us to see the glory that you want us to be throughout these portions and to be more and more wanting to know you deeper and deeper. We give all this to you in Yeshua's name. Amen.